Well, I hope you had a good Christmas. I hope, like Pastor Craig said, you ate lots of food and had a good time with family and friends. And for everyone uh, probably in the same boat as me, where your family and friends are overseas or you can't quite get there, you found other friends and other family uh, to, to, do, to do life with. And, uh, but just know that if you're ever alone, there is always a family here at your church that wants to spend time with you and wants to hang out with you. And so never, ever don't reach out. Always reach out and find someone who wants to hang out with you. But, uh, you know, I think I've found something in common uh, for every single one of us in this room, online as well, I think this will talk to you, something that we all have in common. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, for every single person, whether you're a young person who's just finished high school or starting high school, whether you're a grandparent who, who has uh, grandkids and is retired, whether you're a single mum, shout out to all the single mums, you guys are amazing. Whether you're a single young adult navigating all that comes with that, whether you're a young married couple, whether you've got kids like I do that are one and four years old, I think I, I, I found something that we all have in common. Even Pastor Craig and Nadia, I think you guys will have this in common with us. Do you want to hear what it is? Yeah. It's these three words. I believe at some point in your life, you have either said these words, muttered them under your breath, or you've thought these three words. Are you ready? Yeah. This is what they are. I've done enough. <laughs> Come on, be honest. We've all thought it. Some of us have muttered it, muttered it under our breath when our boss was around. And others of us have shouted at our parents saying, I've done enough. I don't want to do anymore. That's enough. I, I, I've, I've been there. I've done that. Yeah. You know, I was thinking a couple of, about a month ago, uh, like I said, I've got a, a one-year-old named Brooklyn and a four-year-old named Kaiser. And amazing kids. Honestly, we're so blessed with how well uh, that they, how good they are to us. But about a month ago, Brooklyn just decided to be the second child that she is and play up and uh, wake up at about 2 a.m. every morning. Like, she, she's been a great sleeper for a long time. Thank you, Lord. Uh, because I cannot handle a not good sleeping kid. I just do not operate. I always say, don't judge me for what I'm like at 2 a.m. in the morning, because that's not me. Uh, But, you know, Brooklyn started to wake up at 2 a.m. almost every morning, and I would get up, and I'd I'd try everything. If you're a parent, you know, you just go through the list of things that you try. Uh, You know, you try the, the, the dummy, or you try the bottle, or you try rocking them, you try sitting with them. And just nothing was working. And I've, I, I pride myself to have a bit of the Midas touch when it comes to putting the kids to sleep. You know, like I, I think I can, I can get them to sleep pretty well. Uh, so anyway, last resort. I don't know if there's any other dads out there with me, but last resort, I put her in the car and I went for a drive. <laughs> Has anyone else done this at 2 a.m. in the morning, right? Oh, my gosh. So I was like, first night, I was like, perfect. It worked great. Next night, she does it again. I'm like, oh, I really don't want to go straight to that because then she'll get used to it. So I'll do the whole... You know, I'll go to the list again. So I went through all the different things. Didn't work in the car. And it worked. So I was like, great. Put it back to sleep. All good. But I remember kind of the third or fourth night. And, uh, and you know, Hannah's really awesome. She's an amazing mum, like incredible mum. Shout out to Hannah. She's incredible. But these nights, I was just dealing with it, right? So I, I was... <laughs> and I think I got to the third or fourth night. And I, I, you know, I just wanted to shout, I've done enough! <laughs> Can you please come and help now? Like, I've, I've had enough of this. But being a good husband, I kept it to myself, and I just moved on. I, uh, I witnessed another time, just at our, our church staff Christmas party, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, where I, this person obviously thought to themselves, I've done enough. Uh, and I, I'm going to single them out this morning, so be scared if you're at our church <laughs> Christmas party. But, you know, we'd had this amazing day. We'd gone play croquet. It was fun. Then we went back to a house for lunch, had a big barbecue lunch, and it was, it was, it was really good lunch. It was like my Christmas lunch, actually. It was great. And then, you know, what comes after lunch? The dishes. Exactly. Thank you, Lucy. The dishes come <laughs> after lunch. So anyway, you know, being the good guy I am, I start packing up the table. We go to the dishes thing. Me and Pastor Craig are there, and we're, you know, doing the dishes. Robbie comes and helps. Uh, a couple other people come. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're doing dishes for a while, and then Robbie's gone. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, Robbie. Where are you? And I look over at this amazing lounge suite, which is like you can get lost in it. And he's just kicking back, you know, <laughs> closing his eyes. And I thought to myself at that point, he obviously was doing the dishes and thought, no, I've done enough. And then walked away. I'm sure there's many times that when we were kids, our parents would ask us to do chores. And, and we just do a few and then they ask us to do another one that they didn't tell us about. And we either shouted it or we, you know, thought it. Probably most of us shouted it. I've done enough, mum. I don't want to do any more. <laughs> Maybe you've had a moment at work where it's quarter to five on a f- uh, Friday. You finish at 5 p.m. You've done everything that's expected of you. 
and then uh, your manager or your boss comes in and asks you to do a few more things. And depending on your relationship with your boss at that point, you either shouted, I've done enough, at him and walked out, or you kept it to yourself and did the job, or you just had a bad attitude about it. We've all had these moments where we said, we thought, or we, you know, we've said this thing, I've done enough. And, uh, you know, there's some people in the Bible that I was thinking about when this thought came to mind that probably felt like this as well. And it's the people that were sitting when Jesus was teaching his famous Sermon on the Mount. And some of us may be familiar with this, and some of us, it might be new to us. That's okay. It's in Matthew 5. And Jesus basically saw this crowd coming, and he decided to just go and teach them. So he did this amazing sermon. I'd encourage you to go read it in in Matthew 5. And this is the one scripture that that jumped out to me that probably made them feel like I was just uh, explaining then. And it's Matthew 5, 41, which says, If a soldier demands you to carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Oh. <laughs> like, really, Jesus? Like, as if it wasn't enough that a soldier was demanding me to carry something for him for one mile, and now you're saying, don't only do what they're demanding, do more than that and be happy about it. Yeah. You're like, it, it was actually a very real situation in that time that, that Roman soldiers would just grab someone and say, you have to do this. And so Jesus was speaking very specifically to that. But uh, I'm like, the thing is, is that earlier on in the sermon, Jesus says all this nice stuff, right? So let's put ourselves in their shoes. This is what they've been listening to. They've been sitting in a church or on a hill, and Jesus has been teaching. And he says stuff like this in verse 8. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see, they, they will see God. You're like, oh, great. Preach it, Jesus. That's awesome. Verse 9. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. How awesome. Great, great preaching, Jesus. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. Oh, that's great. Verse 14, you are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. So at this point, you know, these people are pretty pumped with what Jesus is saying. They're like, man, he's preaching some good stuff. It all starts to turn around, around about verse 21. He says, you have heard that your ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say... If you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. Whoa. So at this point, they're like, they're getting all this good stuff, and then all of a sudden, Jesus just goes, and he says, you know, I know that you've been told that you'll be subject to judgment when, if you murder, and you're all like, yeah, fair enough. Like, that's a pretty good rule. Uh, and then Jesus goes, but even if you have anger towards someone, you will stand at the gates in judgment day, and you will be judged for having anger. That's pretty crazy turnaround. Like, I don't know when you first heard the Bible and all this, you know, these, you know, the last shall be first and all that kind of stuff happened. But these guys were hearing this for the first time. Right. They, they would have just been like, whoa. Yeah. And then it continues. And then it finally, it gets to this verse, which I'm talking about, which says, if a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Right. This moment is huge because it, Jesus sets up the parameters for us as Christians that we're not just here to live how the world lives. Yeah. That we're not just here to live to the expected amount that everyone else expects right. of us. We're actually here to live as extra mile people. That we're here to live as people that would go the extra mile. We are called to serve others when it's not expected. We are called to love others when it's not expected. We are called to forgive others when it's not expected. I don't know if you've tried that, but it's really hard to forgive someone that you feel like they're not worthy of your forgiveness. When it comes to serving others, when it comes to loving others, I have to tell you this, we cannot afford to be saying, I've done enough. When it comes to sharing the gospel with people and letting other people know the love and the joy that we've experienced, if you have, if you haven't, then today's your day. We cannot afford to be walking down the road and say, I've done enough. We are called to go the extra mile. Are you an extra mile person? When the Holy Spirit lives within us, we're not just called to be extra mile people. We're graced and we're empowered to be extra mile people. Because I don't know about you, but in my own humanly abilities, there ain't no way that I can be an extra mile person. There is no way at all that I could carry that soldier's gear a whole nother mile after he's just made me take it a mile. There's no way that I could forgive the person that I've been so angry against for so long if I didn't have the Holy Spirit within, within me and God's, uh, God's guidance. So really quick, I want to give us kind of three things that, when, that happen when we continually go the extra mile. So the result, when we continually go the extra mile, the first one is it creates a generous spirit. Have you ever encountered someone that within just a really small amount of time of being with them, you know they're a generous person? I I, I remember this like it was yesterday. I came to Melbourne and I met Brendan Michelle. 
and, and just even without being in a church environment or whatever, just being at his house watching sports together, I just realized so quickly that he had a generous spirit. Yeah. Have you ever encountered someone like that? You just know. You know when you know. Right? Someone. On the other hand, have you ever encountered someone that you know isn't a generous person? Yeah. You know? I remember when I met Robbie. I mean, no, jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've given him enough today. <laughs> but we know those people as well because it shines out of us who we are. Well, we don't even have to say anything. It's just the way we act. It's the, it's the way we walk up to the table and get food. It's the, it's the way we, we open our presents. It was Christmas yesterday. Who loves to, to receive presents? Yeah. It's okay. You can say yes. <laughs> Who loves to give presents? Yeah. Everyone? It, it feels good, doesn't it? It feels good to be generous, but generosity is something that is, that is learnt. That, that is a, something that we do over and over again. And, and it, just, it just feels so good when we go the extra mile and we're generous for people. And, and I believe that God puts his hand upon it and, it and he blesses when we do that, when we go the extra mile for people. The second one is when we continually go the extra mile, it sets us apart. When we go over and above for others, when we go over and above at work to do more than it's expected, when we stop and we help someone in need, when we pay for someone else's meal, when we pay for, uh, we take meals to our neighbours, when we know that they're not doing well and that they just need some support. When we give our time to serve at Community Kitchen or to serve at Christmas Box or to serve at church. When we call or message someone and just say, I was thinking of you, how are you? When we pray for our enemies. When we forgive someone who's not worthy of our forgiveness, it sets us apart from the world. It sets us apart from what other people do in this life. And what that does is it shines a light on who we are. It shines a light on the love that comes out of us. And, you know, earlier on in Matthew 5, like I said before, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he says this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is it if salt has lost its flavor? (sighs) Macca's chips with no salt on them. (laughs) Oh, don't even get me started. It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. That's what I'm going to do to all my chips that don't have salt from now on. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp, puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is meant to be placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Can I just say that again? In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. When we go the extra mile, we are the salt of the world. When we go the extra mile for people, we are the light that's on the top of the hill that cannot be put down. Come on, think about in your workplace or in your, your university or in your house and your family yesterday. No doubt we, we had time with family yesterday where there's a, a mix of Christian and non-Christian or that kind of environment. Like Your good deeds in that moment shine and say so much. Like, what are you doing in your workplace that, that is consistent, going the, going the extra mile consistently for others and, yeah. and for your workplace and, and showing others that God is not a God of just the normal. God is not a God who just says, just stay in this box. Yeah. The God that we serve is a God that says, go the extra mile. Do something other people don't do. It will set you apart. Yeah. It will make you the light on the top of the hill. Amen. We are showing God's love to all. It makes us the light of the world, the city on the hill that cannot be hidden. So number one was it gives us a generous spirit. Number two was it sets us apart. Number three, it helps us to fulfill the two greatest commandments. I love this because someone, you know, there's these commandments that we know about in Exodus that, that started right at the beginning. And someone asked Jesus the question. This is the kind of question I'd ask Jesus. Like, teacher, in Matthew 22, 36 to 40, teacher, What is the most important commandment of the law of Moses? Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A secondly equal important is love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all its demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. To love God and to love others. To love God and to love others. When we go the extra mile, it helps us to love God. You know, when it comes to turning up to church, 
you know, you may think, oh, I'm just going to turn up to church every other week and, oh, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll give every now and again. I'll, I'll go do Christmas box and, and, I, and I'll help there and I'll look after this person there. But what this is saying is that when we go the extra mile, it's not about just doing that. It's not about just doing what you can. It's about going over and above. When it comes to loving God, it's not just about turning up to church once every couple of weeks and saying, I've done enough. It's about loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. You've got to go all in. If I always think about the story of the rich young ruler, you may have heard this story before, you may have not, that's okay. There was a guy who said that he had done everything that needed to be done. He had ticked all the boxes of Christianity, of church. And he comes up and he says to Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And if you know the story, you know that Jesus replies, that's all awesome, but you need to get rid of everything and you need to come follow me. And at that moment, the rich young ruler of the story says that he turns around and he walks away. That would be my example in the Bible of someone not going the extra mile. Someone standing there and going, hmm, I've actually done enough. I tell you, I don't want to be the rich young ruler. I don't want to be a person who meets Jesus face to face, which with the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to do every single time that we're in church, every single time we're in our room. I don't want to meet Jesus face to face and have a moment where I turn around and walk away and say, I've done enough. I, I, I just, I don't want to be that person. I don't know where you're at in, in all of this, but I don't want to be that person. You know, Jesus speaks to this a couple of chapters later when he talks about how people are going to get to judgment day and they're going to say, Lord, I did this and I did that and I did this. And he's going to reply, I, will, I never knew you. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to get to the gates and be staring Jesus in the face and him turn around and say, I never knew you. We cannot get to a place in our own Christianity, in our own relationship with God where we start to say or we start to think I've done enough. We have to be people that continually decide, I'm going to go the extra mile. I may not feel like it. I may be sick. I may be this. I may be that. But I'm going to keep going. And I'm going to believe that God's going to come and meet me where I am. I don't want to be someone who says to God, I've done enough. You know, I'm thankful for a bunch of our kids team. As Pastor Craig said, my wife and I get the honor to be our kids pastors here. And there is some team that have been serving week in, week out for the last month and a little while. Every single week, nonstop, who could have easily looked at a roster request that we sent out this week and said, I've done enough. They could have easily, they've been on every, Sophie, Haley, James, they've all committed to being there every week. And if you're a parent, aren't you glad that we have a kids team that is saying yes every week? Not just to look after your kids, but to actually teach them about Jesus, to teach them about this kind of stuff. Our team are incredible, but they could have easily looked at a roster coming into this 26th and the second Boxing Day and just after New Year. And they could have said to themselves, well, I've done the last four weeks. I've done enough. But I am so thankful that they don't live like that because they're extra mile people. They're people who say they don't want to get to the heaven and and look at God and say, oh, I've done enough. So I didn't do it. They want to be people who continually serve God's house. And I'm not saying you have to serve every week, but it's a spirit that they serve with, which is just amazing. As I said before, when it comes to reaching people, and this is what they live by because they want to reach the kids. They want you to be able to come to church, our amazing kids team. When it comes to reaching people with the gospel, we cannot afford to say, I've done enough. There is too much at stake. There is the very real reality that there is a heaven and a hell that we are going to experience one day. And we're going to go either way, whether it be into heaven or whether it be into hell. I'm sorry if that's the first time you've heard this today. But this is the truth, that there is a reality that at the end of this life, we are going to be going one way or the other. This is true. And I'm sorry, but there is too much at stake for us as Christians to stand there and say, I've done enough. 
I'm not going to, I packed Christmas boxes last week, so hey, I I don't need to go and hand them out this week. Or I I, I served in church last week, so I'll just take a week off this week. Who is the person in the foyer that you're missing because you're not here? I'm sorry if I'm passionate about this, but there is too much at stake. There is people that are walking in here, maybe you're one of them today, that don't know the love of Jesus, and they are going to go to hell. But we are the difference in that situation. Our God came and He died on the cross for us so that we could live and have eternal life in heaven. And we are the ones, the carriers of that message. We are set apart. Come on, we are are there to be generous to others. We are there to be extra mile people. We cannot walk down the road, see someone in need, and tell ourselves I've done enough. Oh, I helped do this this last week. I served at a church. I gave this money. I'll, I'll pray for them tonight. Does that sound familiar? I'll draw your attention to the parable of the Good Samaritan, where this exact scenario happens, I believe. Luke 10, verse 30 to 34, and it says this. In reply, Jesus said, and this is a a story that Jesus is saying, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw the man on the ground, passed by on the other side of the road. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and a wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The priest and the Levite, they walk past. And if I can put words in their mouth, I think they would have said, I've done enough. All through the scripture, we read that there's people like that, that they understand they ticked all the boxes and they didn't have to do other things like that. But Jesus came to change that narrative, that it's not about ticking the boxes. It's not just about worshiping this way or coming to church this many times a week. It's about a heart connection with with Jesus, and that's the only thing that gets you to heaven. When it comes to reaching people with the gospel, I'll say it again. We cannot afford to start saying, I've done enough. We cannot afford to walk down the road and then pass to the other side to move past someone who's in need. Who is there in need in your life? Who is there that you need to go the extra mile for? Who is there that you need to forgive? Who is there that you need to just love on regardless of what they've done to you? I'm thankful that Jesus never said I've done enough. We celebrated his birthday yesterday. How cool. Jesus came and he lived a perfect life. A life that was blameless, that was sinless, that... There was, there was nothing wrong with the way that he lived. He, he showed us the way to live a life that is how you should. I'm thankful that when he started to realize or he started to get intel from the Father that he was going to have to die on a cross for everyone else who'd done everything wrong. I'm thankful that at that moment he didn't say, I've done enough. I lived a perfect life. I did this. I did that. I don't need to do that. I'm thankful that Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. And as it says in the Bible, that the way to heaven is through Jesus. If anyone had a resume to say, I've done enough, it was Jesus. If anyone had the bit of paper that they could wave at the gates of heaven and say, I did enough. Like, look at all this. I healed this person. I helped that person. I loved on that person. That that person was getting stoned and I stopped it and I made it better. He just waved that resume and it was all good. But Jesus taught us the perfect way to live, which is not about all that stuff. It's not about the deeds we do, the acts we do. It's about the heart relationship with God. And I want to ask you the question this morning, do you have it? I've shared pretty extensively that there is a reality that there is heaven and hell that we need to make a decision where we're going. I can tell you that there is hope for that today. If you don't have a relationship with God, there is hope for you. 
I, I found this love when I was 15 years old. I, I started a relationship with God. It's now been 16 years. I'm 31. I've never looked back. My, my eternity is secure. I know that every day I get up and I'm secure in the fact that I have a hope that goes beyond circumstance. I have a hope that goes beyond everything that's going on. When all that was happening this year was happening, I have a hope that goes beyond that. And if you have that hope already this morning, then I want to ask you the question, how are you living for the extra mile? How are you living to love on others? How are you living to reach others? If you don't have a relationship with God this morning, then now is your, this is your time. I want to give you the opportunity to meet God like I did when I was 15. I want to give you the opportunity to say, I, I need this, Jesus. I can't walk out of here. There's too much at stake. So just ask everyone to close your eyes and bow your head. If you're online, why don't you do this as well? And we're just going to have a moment where you can have your own self audit. And I'll ask you the question again Do you have a relationship with God? If you don't, today's your day to get one. Today's your day to find a relationship with God. You know, the Bible is very clear that every person that confesses that Jesus is Lord will be saved. And that's all you have to do this morning. There's no steak knives that have to come with it. There's no details that you have to fill out. There's a transaction that you have with heaven right now where you say, Lord, you're my Savior. Lord, I need you. Forgive me of my sin. And if that's you all over this room, I just want you to lift your hand and say, well, I need that. I need Jesus in my life. I need this relationship. If that's you, just lift your hand right now. Be bold, be courageous. It's okay. Jesus sees you where you're at. And he knows what you're going through. He knows what you're thinking right now. Whether you've made this decision before or this is the first time that you'd be making it, I just want you to lift your hand and say, that's me, Will. I need this relationship with God. I can't walk out of here the same. There is too much at stake. Amazing. If you're online as well, making this decision, then everyone in this room and online, why don't you pray this prayer after me and we'll just commit our life to Jesus. Say this after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for today. I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. I'm sorry that I've messed up. I acknowledge from today, you are my Savior. I'm sorry for everything I've done wrong. And from today on, I want to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.